on your left and who's on your right. Forget about what the day you've had or the week you've had. Think about who he is. Think about the fact that we could stand in front of an almighty God. We could come boldly to the throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus. The kids can be released. The kids are going to come back after the service and have communion with us. They're not going to have it now, they're going to have it after. But as we sit here for the next few minutes, I want to, our hearts to be bowed before him. We must receive what the Spirit of grace has to say. Father, we thank you. Our hearts are prepared before you. Father, it's not my will, but your will be done. Lord, we want to know what your Spirit has to say. We thank you, Father, for the finished work of the cross. Jesus is Lord of this meeting. Jesus is Lord of our hearts. Jesus is the Lord of our life. And we thank you for what you did at the cross. Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher. And we honor you tonight. We thank you for what you're about to do. For you have risen and gone before us. For your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So your word, Father, is in need here tonight. Your spirit to be manifest in us tonight. And we thank you in advance. So we don't come to you as slaves, but we come to you as sons and daughters. We come to you as family. What manner of love is this that you lay down in your life for us? That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And the victory is ours, amen. We are the head and not the tail. We sit at the right hand of the Father in majesty. And I thank you for what you're about to do. Jesus, you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. All power is unto you. And we get to participate in what you do in this earth because it's your kingdom come and your will be done. And we thank you in advance. And we give you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. And if you agree, say amen. Give the Lord a clap. Come on, give him a Lord a clap. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Welcome this Sunday. It's an honor to be with you and share the word with you and fellowship with you. And who knows that Christianity is not a religion. Some people make it a religion. But Christianity, or to be followers of Christ, is a family. We have a heavenly father who loves us. We have a heavenly savior who is our brother, the son of God. And we have the great Holy Spirit. The Bible, throughout the Bible talks about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. It's, he's not just the God of one. He's the God of many. He's the God of the generations. And there's a, remember we spoke a few weeks ago, there's a pattern in the Bible. It's not a formula, it's a pattern. Unfortunately, sometimes as Christians, we, we fall into formula or religion or a type of, uh, a type of uh, the Bible says, you have a form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof because we fall into a trap of formula. But God doesn't bless formula. He blesses relationship. Amen? And Jesus taught us how to pray, our Father. He didn't say my Father. He said, our Father, collectively. Amen? So our faith is based on Jesus, as we know, the Messiah. But we need to know that when we come together, we come as a family. Amen? Not as a religion. I want to know him and the power of his might and the fellowship of his suffering. What does that mean? It means that whatever any family goes through, we go through. 
Uh, we're in this together, amen? Amen? He says, go into all the world and make disciples, not converts. So we've all been here, we're all going to be discipled. But in order for us to know where we're going, I often say this, in order for me to know where I'm going, I need to know what he's already done. That means, if I don't know what he's done, where do I go? Where am I going? Am I just floating to see what happens? Am I floating through life, hoping for the best? Uh, am I going through life saying three quick, quick prayers or three text messages or read a bit of devotional for two minutes and I said that's my Bible time and, and I'm still I'm, I'm, I'm oblivious as to where I'm going. But we need to know where we're going. Because isn't it interesting, the early church was called the people of the way. Well, the way to where? What way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. And if you've been around long enough, you know that scripture. But today I want to talk about the Last Supper or the Passover feast leading up to Easter. But there's so much to the Last Supper and there's so much to the, the feast of the Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. You come from different backgrounds, you'll call it the Lord's Table, the Last Supper, the Holy Communion, whatever you want to call it. But there was so much than just Jesus breaking his body and shedding his blood. There was so much going on that night. I'm going to try and cover it in the time I have. But I want us to get a picture of what actually happened that night. There's some, when I was searching this out, I've been searching this out for a while, over, over these few months, but over a few years, like different little snippets about the Last Supper. And I don't know about you, but I've got nagging questions. I like, I like to ask those questions that no one wants to ask because we just traditionally believe in something and we just... Uh, tradition in itself is not bad. But tradition, if it glorifies Jesus, is not bad. But a lot of us here, if I look around, we come out of traditional backgrounds and we believe things and we've been taught things, but no one questions why we believe it. True? No one believes me then. What about this story where this lady in America, they celebrate Thanksgiving and they kill a turkey and eat a turkey. Everyone knows that, Thanksgiving. And they were, eating, they were celebrating Thanksgiving one day and they finish eating and they said to the, to the mum, the lady who hosted said, wow, this turkey was unbelievable. Like I've never tasted turkey like this. What's the secret? And she said, I don't know. My, my mum taught me how to make it and, and all the spices. But we, we do cut the leg off the turkey. Okay, maybe that's the secret. Let me ask my mum. So she calls her mum. Mum, how are you? Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Because can I ask you, you know when you taught me to make the turkey, is ours different, tastes different because we cut the leg off the turkey? She goes, I don't know. My mum taught me that. Because I'll oh, ask my mum. I'll ask your grandmother. So she rings up her grandmother and says, Grandma, goes, yeah, yeah. Uh, her mum, that is, which is the grandmother, and says, how come our turkey is different and tastes different? Is it because we cut the leg off the turkey? She goes, no, I only cut the leg off because the, the pan wasn't big enough. So she taught her daughter how to make turkey in a, in a pan, but the pan wasn't big enough, so they used to cut the leg. So she just assumed that's how you do it. So she cut the leg and she taught her daughter. So everyone's cutting the leg off the turkey, but no one asks why. That's tradition. That we can believe something for the sake of it because it's got passed down and have to no effect. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? Your tradition have made the word of God of no effect. See, sometimes we can get our tradition in the way. As I said, tradition in itself is not bad, but if it gets in the way of the word of God and it doesn't empower you in the word of God, then it's not of God. So let's have a look. Let's break some sacred cows here tonight. Who, who was happy to, to unbelieve something that you've believed? Call it sacred cows and, you know, who's ready to... I love how when I came to the Lord, I thought I knew everything. In the first week, I knew everything. That's it. Then two weeks later, I thought I knew more than I knew. Oh, I know more. Oh, heavy duty. And a few months later, I realized I don't know nothing. And how wrong I was in this area and how wrong I was in that area. And then the, he turns you upside down. And when you sort of got a foundational platform, wow, God is good and God's using me, God turns you upside down again and takes about what you think you learned and rips it all out again. And who knows on that? It's like a, like a washing machine. 
We used to have a horn shoot at home and it used to bounce. Boom, 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 boom. We used to break dance to it. But it was actually, it was unlevel and it was breaking. At the That's how I felt as a Christian, you know? Anyway, I don't know why I did that. So in the 1400s, who knows Leonardo da Vinci? Who watched the Da Vinci Code here? All right, you all need to repent. You know, can you take those names, Janet? There's a weeby over there. Michael, did you watch it? Did you 100% look his crowd? <laughs> He's bigger than me. I'll let him say what he wants. All right. But Leonardo da Vinci painted a painting. He's, he's, he's very famous for the paintings that he did. One of them was The Last Supper. If we can throw it up there. He did this in the 1400s. I think it was 1495 to 1498, I reckon, he painted this. Now, who has never seen this? I mean, I grew up at home. My parents had us, I mean, every house. I mean, if you grew up, you know, in a Catholic background or in a traditional background, you would have had this photo. I, I remember people had like uh, woven rugs. Who's had that? The big woven rugs. Really nice, beautiful tapestry hanging up on the wall. And this is traditionally what we perceive the Last Supper. Is it true? People still have it hanging in their houses today. And it's a beautiful painting, and it's a Leonardo who lived in the 14, 1400s, late 1400s. And that was his depiction or his revelation of the Last Supper. And this photo is very famous. As I said, it goes around the world. It was used as a depiction of the Last Supper for centuries. And um, like I said, they made movies on it, and a lot of the Hollywood movies would have the Last Supper looking exactly like that. Who hasn't watched King of Kings? All the old ones. But in latter days, people have gone and made better movies with more accurate depiction of the Last Supper. But it's interesting, you say, well, what's the, what's the point? I mean, they made a movie, The Da Vinci Code. There was supposed to be some secrets in there and that. And all of a sudden, there's hidden meanings everywhere. And this guy lived 14, 1500 years after Christ, and now we're going to believe him. So, go burn the CD, Michael. Jakey. But the painting itself is, is, is a nice painting. But in actual fact, when we look at this painting, you think, well, what's the big deal? But when I read the scripture, and we're going to read it, and I've got a few little pictures I'll show you tonight. As I was studying this, now, no one was there. There was no paparazzi taking photos of the Last Supper, all right? They went, uh, you know, small. So we don't know who sat where, true? But we can tell by a Passover feast and a Jewish traditional Passover, if someone hosted the Passover, say Jesus said to his disciples, go and prepare a place for the Passover. Go into the city. You'll see a man. Follow him. Tell him the Lord wants the room. And we'll read it all for the sake of time. But we're going to read this out of John and prepare the Passover. And we're going to talk about how he prepared. And there was a certain way they sat according to Jewish tradition. So as I was studying this, I learned so much knowing that when I read the scripture and, and see what Jesus said at the, at the Last Supper and, 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 and what happened at the, at the Last Supper and after he went out and went to the garden that he was crucified. It really opened up my eyes because I read some scriptures years ago, which I never really understood. And as I put this together, the Lord really showed me so many, so much clarity. And just to see how good, how perfect our word of God is. Amen. So this is a little bit of a history lesson today. So I'm going to get Antoine to read for the sake of not boring you and putting you to sleep. John chapter 13, verse 1 to 30. We're going to read the whole chapter of John and then we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. Amen. Are you ready to go? Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. 
Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What am I doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this? Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are, all, uh, you are not all clean. You call me... Oh. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should go give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Okay, so I know there's a lot there. Thanks, Antoine. This is uh, the account of the Last Supper in John. If you read it in Luke and in Matthew and Mark, um, this is based on at the end of the feast. Um, there was um, uh, in Matthew and Mark, it talks about, obviously, if you read it, Matthew and Mark talks about he broke bread and gave thanks. And, and we know that, the, you know, he, this is my body broken for you. This is the wine of the everlasting covenant. And it also talks, it's interesting to, to note that here, it's interesting to note, he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they also, you know, in, in the Luke account and Matthew's account, say, is it I? Is it I? Is it me, Lord? Is it, you know? And I don't know if they really understood what he meant that someone's going to betray me. Because we know after the fact what the betrayal was. But they could have had, oh, am I, have I done something wrong, Lord? Have I said something wrong, Lord? Have I done what you asked me to? And maybe thought that was a betrayal. So they're all asking each other, who, who was it? But it's interesting here in the verse, um, in verse 18, he says, when he was washing their feet. And Peter says, no, you're not washing my feet, Lord. Now, in a historical sense, um, whether this was a Passover, but in a historical sense, if you traveled into a far land or you came to someone else who, who had servants, they would wash your feet because, you know, obviously in those days, they didn't have Nikes and army boots and they had sandals and they probably weren't very comfortable and they would work on dirt roads. They didn't have clean roads. So it was very common for the servants to wash the people's feet as they came into the house. Very traditional. And in this case here, Peter understood that. Peter's understood that, you know, Lord, no, Lord, you, know, you can't wash my feet. And he says to him, well, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you, look what he says, you have no part of me. 
no part of me. That's pretty heavy, if you understand. It's not saying, well, I can't help you. He said, no, you have nothing to do with me. It's over. He said, then wash my head and wash my hands and wash whatever. He says, no, but those who are clean, those who are bathed are clean. But the word, but Jesus says, for the words I've spoken over you, you are clean. It's only your feet that need washing. And yes, this is a type and shadow of Jesus being, didn't come to be served, he came to serve. Are you with me? He says, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And you do likewise. That's part of our job, amen? Because when we get to heaven, he's not going to say, well and done, good and faithful preacher, or good and faithful giver, or good and faithful prayer, or good and faithful intercessor, or good and faithful. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So our job is... And, and, and there's an argument going on here at the same time. In, in Luke, it's funny because I'm not going to read the whole lot. We'll be here all week. But in Luke, he says, you know, one of you is going to betray me. And then two minutes later, they're arguing who's the greatest in the kingdom. <laughs> Man's ego. Not, oh, like, oh, is that me, Lord? And they go, oh, I think I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. We know that one of the mums uh, asked, can, I have my, can my boys be on your right-hand side and your left-hand side in your kingdom? Because you don't know what you're asking. And, and then we look at all these dynamics because there's so much going on here. See, they're thinking they're celebrating a Passover feast. I said this last week and, and for the sake of some new people, the Passover feast was celebrated and it will be celebrated again this year by all the Jews when the, when the lunar eclipse is coming and they, it goes off the moon and what have you. So um, they do the, the Passover feast. So, and, and, and they celebrate it according to the moon cycle and and. Every year they would do that once a year and have a Passover feast and talk about how God protected them because of the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost when the angel of death passed over, which is called the Passover celebration. Are you with me? So that's, that was the celebration. But even before that, we have in Leviticus and Deuteronomy accounts where the priest would go to the showbread and, and break bread and, and drink wine. And we have a picture of the, the communion table even in Genesis, if you want to go all the way back, to show you a picture and a type and shadow. So yeah, Jesus is celebrating the Passover feast because at the Passover feast, they had bread, they had wine, they would have killed the lamb, they would have roasted the lamb, they would have ate. And in the midst of all that, Jesus comes and he drops a bomb. Now Jesus up until this point, he's been telling him, I'm going to be given over to the sinners. I'm going to be handed over to sinners and I'm going to die. I'm telling you now so, you so your heart doesn't fire you. And he's warning them. And they're not listening. They're not getting it. He keeps repeating it. Now he says, when are you going to betray me? They say, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And then later he says, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Me, you, you. And he goes, he tells the analogy, he goes, don't sit in a place of honor. And I'm going to explain what it means. You know the, the, the parable where he says to the wedding, go, don't sit in the good place at a wedding, like the place of honor. Because someone high in you might show up, then they'll tell you to move. Go sit in the back. Go sit in where the servants sit. So then if they bring you to the front, you get honour. In other words, they have promoted you. You haven't promoted yourself. So be the, the, be, who wants to be high, make yourself low. Who wants to be a master, make yourself a servant. Who wants to be first, make yourself last. You get the picture. Yeah? Because we're going to see something here very interesting. In verse 80, he says, I don't speak of all of you. Saying one of you is going to betray me. One of you is not clean. He says, now, you know that I have chosen you, but the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Can we go to Psalm 41 verse 9? He says, for the scripture to be fulfilled. Now, I often say this. Please, this understand me. God has given us a free will. And if you don't believe that, then you have some issues. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God has predestined certain things. But God has given you the ability to choose or not to choose. See, what makes us unique of every creature and animal and every beast of, of the world is that we have the ability to choose or not to choose, to receive Christ or not to reject Christ, to love you or to hate you. We have that unique ability. We have a will that can go against the Father or a will that can submit to the Father. Amen? In order for me to love Jesus, I have to make a conscious decision to love me. Just because in Revelations, it talks about the judgment coming upon the world and people shake their fist at God and curse him. They know it's God and they're still cursing him. So we have a will. Here it says in Psalm 149, it says, Even my, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. This is in Psalm. This is David talking about 
one of his best friends betraying him. Jesus now in the Last Supper or in the, the Passover feast says, the one that's going to betray me is the one that eats my bread. And you have to understand that Jesus did wash the feet of the disciples as a servant. He did. He was showing them that you have to do likewise, but there's something a little bit deeper about this. You see, in the Bible, it talks about that, how beautiful are the feet that bring the good news. True? So I can either walk to you and bring edification or I can walk to you to commit sin. My feet do the walking. That's why it says the sandals of peace that bring the good news. The Bible says that they use their feet and they run to commit sin in, in one of the Psalms. Here he's saying, my friend lifted his heel against me. What did he mean by that? See, when he said the one that shares my bread, and we're going to talk about this, but they said, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Am I, uh, am I betraying you? And then you, you see a picture of John, the beloved, laying on Jesus' chest. He says, Lord, who is it? He says to him, the one that shares my bread. And it's even interesting that we keep reading that Judas is the one that took the bread. But when he got up to do what he had to do, the Bible says they didn't know where he was going. Because he had the money purse or the money box, or he was the treasurer of the ministry, they just assume he's going to pay the bill. Think about that. For years, I, 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 I've done my head in. How did they not know it was him? How He said it all. So we got a picture of that. This happened, bang, 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 bang. I want to show you something that, that we show you the Last Supper. Can I have that Last Supper one? The first one? Uh -oh, you, oh, you blew it. It was the first one. Stop there. Anyway, we're here. Unlike, the, unlike this bloke that painted this one, can we go back to the next one, the other one? They actually sat in a U. It's in the shape of the menorah, the candlesticks, the, the, the golden lampstand in a U shape. And according to Jewish history, Jewish customs, that Jesus sat here. Even though that picture depicts that, I couldn't find one. Jesus would have sat here. John sat here. And next to him was Judas. And they sat around a table like that. It, look at this. He gets the one that shares my bread. So what he was doing here, Jesus, before I jump the gun because I'm getting a bit excited. I read these scriptures. Only Luke chapter, uh, Luke 11:37. Get excited. Luke 11:37. 37. This isn't the Amplified. I read this years ago, and I used to say, now after Jesus had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. He went into the Pharisee's home and reclined at the table without ceremonial washing in his hands. This is Amplified. I remember reading this years ago when I first got saved. I thought Jesus was reclining back at a Pharisee's house, then rebukes the hell out of him. Goes, That's the man. Sitting there, legs up. And they're trying to trap him and he rebukes them. That's not exactly what happened, but that's my interpretation. When I first got saved, it never, never left me. But as I was studying this, I saw that this here, it says he was um, reclined. Now, if I was to go back through John and read what, we, what Antoine just read, it says Jesus was seated. But the word seated in the, in the Greek means he was reclining. You read it in the Hebrew. If you go to here, Luke... Um, Go to Luke 22, verse 13 to 14. This is the same account as, as John that we read. They had left and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. This is Jesus sending the disciples to find a place. They found a man with a, with, pitched with um, a water, a water jugs. He says, the Lord wants your upper room. They find an upper room, and they prepare the Passover. And when the, the hour for that meal had come, Jesus reclined at the table and then the apostles with him. Now, again, we read that, we think they're just reclining back, hanging out. But really, it's a custom that they sat. Can we go back to the other um, Last Supper picture? What they would have sat is not on chairs. They were low tables sitting on the ground on mats or cushions. And they all would have sat down, and they all reclined to their left. So they would have leaned over to their left, just like if you're at a picnic. You can't sit straight up and eat. You lay down to one side. And they all ate with their right hand. Very Middle Eastern custom. In some cultures, that they all eat off the same bowl. In Egypt and some um, uh, Semitic Jews, and that, they all, everyone, everyone's going, like, yeah. By the way, that's nice to have communion off the same cup too, by the way. I like his breath. Drink it. Oh, did he wash his teeth? Drink it. But they used to eat from the same bowl. So in some Middle Eastern customs that, 
if you stole something and they caught you stealing, they chopped your right hand off because your right hand was for eating, your left hand was for something else. Toilet wiping. Wipe your backside. So some cultures, if you got caught stealing, the, the punishment was chopping your right hand off so you could never eat with your family again because you, you, you had no right hand. Here, they did the same thing. They reclined to the left and they ate with their right. And that shit, when I read that, I thought, oh, that must be so, oh, what's the big deal? To me, it blew my heart because I could realize now how John was laying on Jesus' chest. And it's amazing here, they believe that this is how they're sitting. Can you go to the other diagram, please? So Jesus, John, and Judas, and they reckon Peter sat here in a place of a servant. Here they're saying, you know that seat was called? The guest of honor. <laughs> Judas was the guest of honor. How? Think about it. Because we're seeing everything from after the fact. See, we think Judas was a, a double agent. He was a mole in the camp. He was shady. Every time Jesus taught, he hid. And, and then and they hang out with the boys. Yeah, let's go. Feed the 5,000. And then he's hiding. No, no. Judas was not. He, he was one of the 12. He was their best friend. He was there when... When Jesus calmed the, sto the storm and, and Peter walked on the water with Jesus and he was there when, you know, they fed the 5,000 twice and he was there when he, you know, raised Jairus' daughter from the dead and he was there, he was there through everything. He wasn't some, some uh, double agent hiding, but there was something wrong with his heart. And we know how he got exposed. Is remember when the lady broke the alabaster box on, and, and washed Jesus' feet? What did he say? Huh? Everyone's speaking in tongues. Aren't they? What was it? Beautiful. Why are we wasting this? This is a year's wage. Sell it and give it to the poor. And the Bible says he didn't care about the poor. He was helping himself to the money bag. Judas was stealing money off Jesus. That's dumb. He was his best friend. That's what the Bible says, the one that shares my bread, my friend that shares my bread. And now he's leaning over. Everyone's leaning to the left. They're all having a conversation with each other. And he says to him, do what you have to do. Leaning over to Judas is the one that, the one that eats my bread, dipped in my cup. Even Jesus to the last minute was giving him a way out by saying, don't take it. Don't take it. And the Bible says that it was too late. And he took it. And the Bible says Satan entered his heart. He said, now, whatever you do, go do quickly. So when he got up to go, I go, well, where's he going? Where's Judas going? To pay the bill? Does that make sense now? That how they didn't know? That they're sitting in the U-shape. And Jesus, Jesus now has to contend with all this. Now, even the one, my friend, who, whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. When he washed their feet, people, listen to me, listen to my heart. If you have lived long enough, and you've been around long enough, someone closest to you is going to betray you one day. I pray it doesn't, but there's a big chance it will. And the Bible says he washed their feet, and the, and they lifted it. What happened? So, so Judas gets up and he walks away. And what does Jesus see? His heels. He sees the back of his heels. He lifted his heel, meaning he walked. I can see the back of his shoes, back of his heels, and he's going to betray me. See, Jesus washed their feet, not because just I want to be a servant and teach you something. He's saying that I have to wash your feet. You're clean. I've spoken the word over you're clean, but one of you isn't. And I'm going to have to wash your feet. Why? Because I have to wash the feet of betrayal. Because if I go to the cross with any offense, I can't be the Messiah and die on the cross. He washed their feet. But you can ask you argue this. They all left him. The Bible says that they strike the sheep, uh, strike the shepherd, the sheep were scattered. What happened on, when we went to the garden? We read this last week. They all ran. They all ran, left him. He washed the feet of betrayal on them. You know, Judas, same feet that betrayed Jesus could have been the same feet that brought him back to be, to be redeemed again. 
Instead, Judas runs and hang, hangs himself. Peter is the same guy that denied him three times. But that same feet, when he saw him cast your net to the other side and saw him cooking fish, he knew this is the Lord. It's interesting. The Bible says he put his clothes back on, his coat back on, and then jumped into the water and ran to Jesus. Speaking, he had taken off his mantle. He'd taken off everything God had put on him. He'd given up. But when he saw, he knew it was the Lord. And he had just betrayed him. Instead of, he put his mantle back on. He put his covering back on that God, and he ran to the Lord, and God restored him. The same feet that betrayed him were the same feet that brought him back to be restored. Amen. See, this, the Lord's table is fascinating. Judas lifted his heel against him. Right? And um, it's interesting to know, for me, is that the Lord's table or the, the, the Passover feast, there was so much going on that Jesus himself understood what was about to happen. And last, if you haven't heard last week's message, just go back and listen to it because it'll, it'll, it'll connect to what I'm saying here today. It's a fascinating thing. Can we have that bread up there? That's a screenshot of the matzah bread. That's the bread. It's, 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 it's the unleavened bread. Now, when the Bible says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven is just yeast. There's a good mate of mine out here. Where is he? He knows all about bread. So I'm not going to try and pretend I know. But leaven, when added to bread, puffs it up. True? Yeast, or leaven, puffed up. And the Bible says, we don't want to be puffed up. In other words, the feast of unleavened bread the Jews used to celebrate was just, uh, just uh, flour and water. Plain as plain can be. No leaven. And it's interesting, that's, how, that's what they ate. I taught on this last year. Who remembers the teaching on the matzah bread? Hey, look at this. It's interesting. Isaiah 53 and verse... I, didn't, I don't think I gave it to, the, to you, Becky, did I? Yeah, I threw a spatter in the work. No, I can read it from here. Give me one sec. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. Very familiar scripture to those. I probably hear it. Yeah. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Can we go back to that picture? He was wounded for our transgressions. The bread that Jesus broke on the Last Supper was a matzah bread. It was unleavened bread. But look what happens when it comes out of the oven. There's bruising. He was wounded for our transgression. Bruised for our iniquities. He was pierced. Wounded. The holes represent the piercing, the stabbing, the thorns, the nails. Pierced. Wounded. Bruised when they bashed him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his by his, we are healed. Every time the Jews sit there and use the matzah bread, they are declaring that Jesus Christ had took the whip, had was pierced and broken for their healing, broken for their sin, broken for their salvation. They just don't know it. From the time this was instituted, the unleavened, Jesus had no leaven in him. He who knew no sin became a sin offering. He who knew no, Jesus was not, didn't have no sin. But out of substitution, he took on sin as an offering, a sin offering, that we could become the righteousness of God. There was no puffed up in him. There was no leaven. There was no sin in him. Speaking of that, Christ had to be without spot and blemish. We can talk about the lamb. But this is the picture of the matzah. This is what they do every... And you know what they do? They have, when they sit around, even to this day on the Sabbath, they put three pieces. They got it on the table. They put three pieces in, um, in, in, in cloth, in white cloth, in the middle one. There's three pieces. They put them, one, two, three. Then what they do, they take the middle one out. They break it. They put it in a white uh, handkerchief or a white um, napkin and they hide it in the house. And then at some part of the Sabbath, they would send the kids to go and find it. And it was a treasure if you found it. 
And the name of that, I forget the, the Jewish word for that name, it means I'll come back. Speaking that middle bread was Jesus, the bread of life. But my body was broken for you and he would die. But guess what? Whoever finds Jesus finds the treasure, he'll come back. That's what it's symbolic of the Sabbath, man. All that is in Scripture. I can be here for two weeks showing you every pinpoint on this Last Supper. So now we've got the wine. And we're symbolic of his blood. But I want to share something a bit deeper. What time is it? We're getting there. Beautiful. That when Jesus celebrated the Passover, he was inclined. He was relaxed. But his heart was troubled. He goes, I desire to share this Passover with you. Not just because he was going to die for the sins of man. Not just because he was going to die for the, for the unrighteous one. Not just because they had to celebrate the Passover feast. Not just to expose Judas to do what he had to do. We understand that he did this for us. Amen. We know that after this, he went to the garden, got arrested and died. And, and, and on, the, on the third day, he rose again. Amen. It's even deep. It even goes a little bit deeper. Why did Jesus do all this? If we go back to the garden, God gave man dominion. God gave Adam to tend to the garden, look after the garden, subdue it. And his job was not just to subdue the garden, but to protect his wife. The enemy gets in. Before you know it, they've eaten off the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then he's eaten of it. And then sin has entered. The eyes were opened. The glory of God left them. Now they feel ashamed and they're sinful. And God had to clothe them with skin, fur. You know, you know the backdrop of Adam and Eve. What had happened? It's not what Adam did in the garden that was the problem. Because that was a problem. It's what Adam didn't do in the garden. See, sometimes you're guilty by not doing nothing. Let me say that again. When he said, look after it, to the garden, tend to it, subdue it. Meaning that someone's going to try and sneak in. To subdue something or to, to watch over something, what are you watching over if there's no one else there? See, the problem was that the enemy kept coming. I believe the enemy kept coming till he wore them down. Genesis is just a summary of what happened. But they're sitting there entertaining this discussion. See, if Adam was faithful and was commissioned to be the gatekeeper of his family, he should have studied, stop talking, get out. Do not let a little leaven to come into your world. But instead, he entertained the conversation. And then one thing you know, the Bible says that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. Well, when she ate, she didn't die. And the Bible says he went and ate. And then their eyes were open. See, it's not what Adam did. That's a part of it. The Bible says she was deceived, but you sinned, Adam. But you know what it was? He didn't stand in the gap before that. Why did you even entertain the discussion? Come on, people. Judas, what did he entertain? That didn't happen that night. Is that, there's no way in the scripture, and I believe it's only in Revelations, that Satan enters someone's heart. It's always an unclean spirit. It's always a, 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 a demonic spirit. It's never Satan. But here, Satan entered his heart. And I believe the only two people I know of in the Bible that Satan enters the heart is Judas and the Antichrist. And they, contrary to some people's theology, Judas was his right-hand man. Does that mean the Antichrist comes out of his right-hand man? I don't know. But what did they, what did he entertain? What did he dwell on? Because if you're reading John and you read it in Luke, Satan was already working at Judas. He's already nitpicking him. You see, I had an old pastor tell me once, he'd counsel a lot of people. He made it so simple, it's not funny. He said, people, and he'd been counseling people for years. He said to me, Every one of them that falls, whether it's uh, relationship, whether it's uh, business, whether it's family, whether it's husband and wife, whatever it is, they're all saying the same thing. I'm sorry, I don't know how I got there. He says, well, let me tell you a story. I'm driving down the street one day, and I'm not even hungry. But there's a sign pops up and says, Mac, it's two, two kilometers away. All of a sudden, oh. I haven't had lunch yet. Well, you know what? I don't like Maccas, but you know what? You start to justify it because that's what I do. It's easy to park. I haven't had lunch. I'm owed lunch. I haven't had lunch. I've been working hard. And next thing you know, Maccas, one kilometer away. 
the sign's getting bigger. And I'm entertaining that idea. I'm hungry. Now I've got justification. Nothing wrong with being hungry, but I'm hungry. This, the, you know what? And the sign, 300 kilometers away. I'm nervous now. But I, do, I turn into the driveway. Next thing you know, I'm in the drive through And I ordered my meal. And I eat my meal. And now I'm upset that I ate the meal. Why did I come in here? I don't know how I got here. Because that's like most people's sin. Because they saw the sign, they entertained it, they meditated on it, they thought about it, they justified it, they're in a place they shouldn't be, and they go, I don't know how I got here. No one does nothing in the spur of the moment. It's something brewing, bubbling, or you're meditating on. Judas didn't just come overnight and say, I want to betray Jesus. Something got into his heart. And here... In the, in, the, in the last supper, the bread, if we go back to that bread, in Isaiah 53, it speaks about God's body to be broken for us. Can you understand now when he broke the bread, what he meant now? His body was broken with the whip on the scourging post. Whoever ever saw the whipping of the passion of the Christ? It was worse than that. Should have died there. Then he got hung, put on the cross, pierced, all for us. But there's also Adam fell in the garden. And we look at that like where Adam sinned, Jesus is the last Adam, he restored all things, amen? Every curse was broken, amen? Are you with me? Every sin was paid for, amen? That we were sinners, now we're sons and daughters of the king, amen? Broke it all. But there was something going down. There was something that broke. If Adam, being the son of God, and Jesus being the son of God, and Adam had a wife named Eve. Well, Jesus had to restore his bride, which is the church. And in a Semitic Jew, contrary to what we do, in the old days, time of Jesus and before, this is how they got married. If someone saw a girl and they liked the girl, they would approach their father. The father would approach her father and say, my son's interested in your daughter. They'd have a conversation. And then they, if they agreed to meet, they'd meet. And they would discuss, the father would tell the daughter, there's a young man interested in you, blah, 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 blah. And then if they got to that point, he says, what are you going to give for my daughter? You know, three goats, a camel and a dog, I don't know. Pay a dowry for her. Depends which culture, you know. And then if they got to that point, they would meet. So it was in a sense, the father would pick the bride for the son in some cases. And what they would do, they would come into the house and the father would pour a glass of wine and put it. And if the girl drank it, she accepted the proposal. If she didn't drink it, the father never forced her to marry him. So the wine was symbolic that if you take this wine and drink it, that means we're going to be betrothed to each other. We're going to be engaged in a sense. And look what Jesus did at the Last Supper. Aren't unknown to them. Jesus was going to the cross as the lamb. We know Jesus was our great high priest. We know the altar was the cross. But there was something he had to do, that the father sent him to get his bride, which is the church. His bride was committing harlotry, adultery against him. We were sinners and rebellious to God, but God says, go and get your bride. But you have to cleanse her. You have to restore her. You have to bring her back to her rightful place. She's damaged. She's been broken. She's been busted. She's been used. She's been abused. She's rebellious. All these things. And he comes and he puts the wine. He says, drink. And they drank, and that's the day he got betrothed to the church. He says, now I have to go. I have to die so I can cleanse you, and I have to go prepare a place in my father's house, and when I come back, I'll bring you back home with me. It's a wedding feast. Because in the old days, in the old days, once she accepted, they would go in the, in the Semitic day, and when, it was, when the wedding was ready, then they would consummate the marriage, then they'd have the wedding feast. It wasn't... Go to the church. What? Well, just freaking out. Go to church, go to the reception, and then go honeymoon. No, no. It was get married, honeymoon, then the wedding party. Isn't it interesting that Jesus came and married us to church? And he's waiting for the, you know what he says here? I will never drink from this again, the fruit of the vine, until my father's kingdom. Meaning, what are we waiting for in Revelations? What are we waiting for in Revelations? The wedding feast, the wedding supper of the Lamb. 
That's the feast when we all come and sit at the wedding banquet with Jesus. That's the wedding. Why? Because he's betrothed up. He's died for us. He's coming to get us to take us where? Back to celebrate with his father in heaven. Because in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. This is the greatest love story in history. We've limited to Jesus died for me and rose again. It's powerful. But there's so much more to the, to the table of God. Because when Jesus comes, he has to flush out what's not his. You see, we can't bring leaven with us. If you read the scripture about the wedding feast, he says, some of you came in with no wedding clothes and they got kicked out. Meaning, what's that? That's a parable. But what's that mean? I haven't got wedding clothes. What, didn't wear a suit? No, no, the wedding clothes is the garment of righteousness. If you're not under the blood, you can't go to the wedding feast. We have to understand the Lord's table when we eat it. It's not only that we thank you for dying for us. We thank you that you redeemed us. But we thank you that you married us and you came one with us. Amen. This is the greatest love feast ever. In, Re in Revelation, it says, Revelation 2, 4, it says, the Ephesian church, I, have, you know, I know your works, blah, blah, blah. But this is what I have against you. You've walked away from your first love. Meaning, you're doing all these things for me, but you don't know me. And the greatest way we can get to know him is, I know we spend time in his word, but you know what? We bow our knee and say, when we take the Lord's Supper, as we're going to do shortly, guess what we're doing? We're declaring that he's come to get us. Because Paul says it this way. Paul does the communion table and he says, what I have received from the Lord, because Paul wasn't one of the 12. He wasn't at that. He wasn't there. He says, break bread, do this in remembrance of me until he returns. Meaning the bride room's coming back to get his bride. Because when he used to come, and it's interesting, if you know, on a side note, if you want to get the kids to come down, but on a side note, when he, would, when he would be betrothed to the girl, he would go to set himself up, to build a bridal part of the house, a room, an extension on the house, to prepare his life. So he could go up to two, three years. Yet she would now isolate herself and put a veil on her head so... She's no longer shown to the world. She's now been betrothed to her husband-to-be. And she doesn't know when he's coming. So what she, she'd have a candlestick or a lampstand full of oil. And she would put the oil and it would burn and she'd trim the wick so it keeps burning because she doesn't know when he's coming. He might show up at midnight one day. Who's heard of that parable? The master goes, we don't know when he's going to return, so we start playing up. Or the ten virgins, five or foolish, five or look at all these stories. It's all it's all based on a wedding wedding ceremony. She used to keep putting oil in her lamp because he might show up at twelve o'clock one day. He, he needs to know where her room is so he can knock on the door and say, That's my bride to be. She needs to keep putting oil. But let's happen. What happens if her oil runs out? What happens if her light's not burning anymore? Has she lost her first love? Wow. Because she has to be ready, because he could come at any moment. The Bible says, like a thief in the night. That's all the scriptures start making sense now. In other words, he had to put a down payment for his bride, which was his life. And she has to keep the oil burning veiled. The Bible says the church is his bride. We've been veiled at the moment. Not with a veil of hiding, but a veil of glory. We represent Jesus. We are meant... Listen to me. We are meant as the church, the body of Christ, to bring the Jews to jealousy, to provoke them to jealousy. We're supposed to, with the blessings we have, the favor we have, the freedom we have, are meant to live our life to bring them to jealousy. Why? Because they're going to say, hang on, we're the chosen ones, but how come they're blessed? How come they're walking in favor? How come they're walking in power? How come they're walking in revelation? Because the veil isn't a veil to hide you no more. The veil is to protect you with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And when the bridegroom comes, guess what? He'll unveil it all in the last day. Because we know in part, we see in part at the moment. Amen? We got to get ourselves ready. How do we get ourselves ready? Stay in love with the bridegroom. Stay in love with him. See, the beauty about the Old Testament wedding was he'd go away to prepare a place. Remember Jesus says, I go to pre prepare a place for you. So in my father's house, there are many mansions or many dwelling places, meaning I'm going to prepare a house when I come back. But see, the beauty about it, but he's left the Holy Spirit here to help us, to prepare us, to keep the oil burning, 
to understand this. So we can sit there when we have communion. You can have, I could never have communion the same again. I could never have communion the same again. Why? Because I understood, yes, it was for my healing. Yes, it was for my salvation. Yes, but he brought me into the Father's house. Wow, he made a covenant. The Bible says, this is my blood shed for you. It's an everlasting covenant. It's not a contract. It's a covenant. It's a promise he made with his blood that can never be broken. Everlasting. We might break our end, but he will never break his end. Can you see the picture of the table now? Does that make a little bit more sense? But the, wing, the thing is, for me, when I saw that, the one that shares my bread, don't share the Lord's bread. Don't have, in other words, that's speaking of his presence. It's speaking of communion. You can't have communion with the devil and Jesus from the same cup. Make a decision today to put away old childish things, to put away the, the sin nature, to put away the old life so the fellowship in the Lord is pure. Because otherwise, you can be in the Father's house sitting on the Father's table, eating the Father's bread and betraying the Father's Son. That's why he says, many will call me a Lord on that day. That's the most scariest scripture. Many call me a Lord on that day. I prophesied your name. I cast out devils in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. Do you know the Lord tonight? Do you know him in an intimate way? Not from a religious way that you tick a box. Yeah, I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Do you know him as a lover knows a husband or a, or a, or a, or a, a husband knows his wife? Because that's what he talks about. That's how you know the Lord, in that intimate relationship with him. Because if you fall in love, how many, who's here ever fallen in love? Not one married person in this room, huh? When I said the other day, Say hello to someone you haven't seen, spoken to for a while. And husband and wife started talking. It was really good. When you fall in love with someone, you only think about them 24 hours, seven days a week. When I fell in love with my wife, she's gone. Good, I can say this. Oh, no, she's at the back. You hang up. Now you hang up. Now you hang up. Now you hang up. All right, I'll hang up. I couldn't do it. Now hang up. I'm busy at my work. It's not true. It's not true. But can we, we can get familiar. Can get familiar for the people we love the most. We can come into church now. You know, one guy said it this way. Most churches do this every week. Some churches do it once a month. Some people do it once a year. And the argument was, well, we don't want to do it every week because it will become familiar. I said, well, stop taking the offering every week. Stop taking the offering every week to become familiar. Come on, man. We should be running to the Lord's table. You should be doing this at home with your family, priests. Talking about dads, you are the priest and the prophet and the, and the king of your home. Because, hey, don't wait for the pastor or the church to protect your family. You have been ordained. Because what did, what did Adam say? What did Adam say? This is the woman you gave me. He must have been Lebanese, that guy for sure. He went Haiti, I mean. You are the gatekeeper. You are, you've been given authority. You have authority over your children and what comes in and what comes out of your home. Stand in the gap for him. But we need help, eh? We need the blood of Jesus, amen. So are all the kids in? Sure are. <laughs> Make it look a true mum that's had them for about two hours, all right. Anyone who hasn't got the communion table? Communion. <coughs> Can we play something in the back? Hallelujah. All right, all right, all right. Give me five more minutes and you can talk the house down. Hear me out, guys. Hear me out. Before we take this, is your, heart, is, your, is your heart right with God right now? Don't run away from the Lord's table. Run to it. But you know what? There's a place where we, the Bible says, judge yourself. You know, the Bible says, God is so good. Judge yourself so I don't have to judge you. How good is that? Assess yourself. 
And I'm not talking about being, I'm talking about pouring your heart out now before the Lord. We all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Every single one of us. But this is the best time to now bow your knee to him now. Bow your heart to him and say, Lord, I think not right. I do not right. I've sinned against you, but I repent right now. And the Bible says, he who confesses his sin, he's faithful and just. Forgive me of all my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And when I partake, you know, if I confess my sin and I repent of my sin, guess what he does? He, justify, he justifies me as if I have never sinned. That's the blood of Jesus. Righteousness means to be right standing before God. And justification means to be just as if I have never sinned. And he gives us that option here tonight. He gives that option to bow our knee to him, bow our hearts to him and say, Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against you. I've broken your laws. I've broken, I've, 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 I've lifted my heart. I've been puffed up. I have leaven in my heart. I've, I've, I've actually turned around and betrayed you and lifted my heel against you. I've denied you. But you are faithful and just to forgive all my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's the promise of Jesus. You know, the Apostle John wrote that when he was about 80 years old before he died. He wrote three little books. It was at the end of his life. And everything's about love. Because he understood the love of God. But it wasn't a camouflage love. It wasn't a greasy grace love. It was a pure, sanctified love. That if you come to him with all your heart, he will give you his heart. That's all he wants, honesty. So we're going to lift up the body of Jesus here now. And understand this, please. He longs for us to come to the table of the Lord. Why? Why did he give the revelation to Paul? He says, do this in remembrance of me until I return. This is declaring what he's done at the cross and how he rose from the dead and he's coming back to get his bride. He's coming back, people. Contrary to what anyone says, Jesus is coming back. And we don't want to be people without any oil. We want to be foolish where, well, he's delayed. So anyway, I'll sort it out later because I've got time. No, you haven't. You don't know when, you don't know when he comes back or you don't know when you die. You don't know the hour or the time of your departure from this world. You do not know. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. That's why he says, I stand at the door and knock. Please let me in. So the body, the matzah bread, speaks of his body that was broken for us. The bread of life, the bread of his presence. And we partake, just like Eve partook of the tree, and sin entered the hearts and, and their eyes were open to the revelation of sin, we partake of the body of Jesus and we get complete healing, complete restoration, complete forgiveness as we eat the body of Jesus. That by his wounds, we are healed. When we partake of his body that was broken, we fellowship with his suffering that we could be healed. That's a promise from the Lord. Father, I thank you tonight. Thank you for every man, woman, and child in the sound of my voice, Lord, that we never come to the Lord's table with apathy. We never come to familiarity. We come with reverence because this is where you betrothed us. This is where you delivered us. And this is where you set us free. So, Father, as, I, as we partake of your body, we partake of the broken body of Jesus that by his wounds, we are healed. That he broke everything that we could have the mind of Christ. And I thank you, Father, for the body that has been broken for us. I thank you, Lord, that you laid down your life for us, that you are the bread of life. And as we partake, we partake of the victory of Calvary and eat in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.
the precious blood of Jesus the precious blood of Jesus shed for us for the remission of sin broke every blood curse that we are inherited from Adam as we drink we drink of an everlasting covenant we drink because we have said yes to Jesus as we drink we drink of his mercy and we drink of his grace and this is a, a blood covenant shed for us he says do this in remembrance of me the Bible says we overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony we don't love our life unto death we testify that Jesus is Lord and as we drink of the promise we drink of the everlasting covenant we don't drink as slaves but we drink as sons and daughters we drink of his mercy today in Jesus name Amen Hallelujah Hallelujah. Can we stand? Just lift your hands to heaven. Come on. Lift your hands to heaven, everyone, even the kids. Come on. Say, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Jesus, that you shed your blood for us, that you love us while we were sinners, and you died for us. But you rose again to give us new life. The old ways have gone away. They've been buried. And the new way, the way, the only way is to you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're our great teacher. Teach us how to love you, how to worship you, how to fellowship with you. I am saved. I am delivered. I am set free. And today, I am a child of God. I am restored. I have His Spirit. I acknowledge You, Lord, that I have been set free. And today, I go deeper in You. Teach me Your ways. Father, I thank You for my family, for my spouse, for my children and Lord I thank you for this church that we can come together as one family have your spirit come upon us and I declare Jesus is Lord over every situation over my life and today is a new day the oil keeps burning the wick keeps getting trimmed I keep burning brighter for Jesus I learn His Word. I eat His Word. Teach me, Holy Spirit, to know Your ways. And from today on, I am a lamp on top of a hill. I am the soul of the earth. And I declare this with all my heart in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs>